the world is to get a certain acceptance, a certain conscious uh, understanding, a final acceptance of the fact. Thousands of persons who would otherwise have died have lived because they were able to achieve a state of acceptance. Rebellion would have killed them in a month in the precarious situation they were in. But acceptance released all of, of nature's energies for reclamation purposes. And almost miraculous recoveries have been reported from such conditions. Because the individual simply got out of his own way. And because he did not add the pressure of his own fear, he recovered. In every walk of life, pressure destroys judgment, limits utility and efficiency, detracts from our peace of mind, destroys the days that we have. Whatever the days may be, long or short, let us use them and not abuse them. Let each day be as full of beauty and of truth and of understanding as possible. He broke the enchantment of his own negation, realized that it was meaningless, and proceeded to do the things that relieved him of all unnecessary strain. Now this is something we all have to do. We have to do it in a number of very subtle ways. Zen would tell us that among other things we must not hate our enemy. And we know from a political standpoint that there probably is nothing more disastrous to the morale of the world today than this psychological warfare between the socialized states and the democratic powers. It isn't really what either side is doing. It's what it might do. It's the long-range fear, the doubts, the uncertainties, the grievances, ever remembered, which is setting these two great groups against each other in a struggle to the death. If both groups could accept, just relax. Mr. Khrushchev could stop pounding desks with his shoe and settle down to the very simple fact that he is perhaps a rather lovable, funny old man. If he can look in the mirror and see himself deprived of his honors and estates, he might look like somebody's grandfather. And he would be much better off if he played the part. Because these things do not mean anything. Khrushchev may be one of these days removed from office by the familiar method. <laughs> he may last a little while. If nothing else happens to him, nature will ultimately remove him. And he will have a life of shouting and howling, screaming and groaning, when he could have had a very happy time of it, and perhaps brought a lot of happiness to many other people. But all kinds of things that are not so move in. Great grievances that must be paid off. Great races of scientific power find out who can get to the moon first. The little question that we haven't gotten around to yet is with the earth going to be here when they get back from the trip. <laughs> this doesn't seem to concern anyone. But this quiet process of acceptance simply lets down these tensions. Uh, in private life, it is such a, a, a very helpful thing, too. There are people who worry the moment their children leave the house, worry if they're not back within five minutes after school is out, worry if the husband is 15 minutes late getting home, Worrying about this, worrying about this and that. A life of worry. 
No wonder these people are hard to get along with and hard to uh, understand. These people are having trouble getting along with themselves because everything suddenly becomes tension. Everything becomes fear. There is no acceptance. How we can be a religious people and claim that we believe in a good God that protects us and how we can affirm the spiritual power of prayer, how we can basically sense that this world is in the hands of an almighty providence, how we can have these feelings and then live from one uncertainty to another with a hundred doubts in a single day and a, a natural instinct to interpret everything as negatively as possible. How such inconsistencies can exist is hard to understand. It can only mean that our religion hasn't gotten in where it is really taking care of things for us. But by acceptance, we can take most of the power out of the bomb. We can certainly take out of it its power to destroy our lives without ever going off. Under the existing conditions, we will produce a generation of nervous wrecks in which two-thirds of our population will ultimately become psychotic and no bomb has been fired. In this situation, two, two were fired. But in the great problem of things, we are living in a tremendous anxiety. And this anxiety will cost us a hundred times the number of deaths caused by the fission of the largest bombs we could possibly create. Furthermore, this type of misery has a terrible chain reaction far more dangerous, more dangerous to us than the mutations that can result from the bomb. Because we are creating a situation in society today of neurosis, of fear, of panic, of loss of personal integration, of breakdown, ethical and moral, which at the least we can say will require ten generations of healthy living to remedy. And there is no prospect at the moment of the ten generations of healthy living. We are actually afflicting the next uh, three or four hundred years of our existence with the attitudes that we are permitting today. So for those who really want a spiritual consolation, a real spiritual help in this situation, consider the problem of the significance of the factual how every moment of the day can bring us great experience of beauty, a great enrichment of understanding. If we can just pause from the panic long enough to be quiet and to receive into ourselves something of the ever-present availability of good, if we can only get away from these exaggerations, we can achieve a great deal that is valuable and important. The next thing that naturally arises in connection with this concept is the reconciliation of our concept of God with the concept of the bomb. Somehow the bomb it caused us to sort of feel that maybe we were too much even for God to handle. That somehow God couldn't prevent the bomb. That this power in man which is God was inadequate to prevent man's own abuse of this power. I think we have, to, we have to revise this thinking a little bit, too. For thousands of years, we believed in hell, very literal hell. 
with nice barbecues in it, <laughs> with our enemies and the members of other beliefs turning on spits <laughs> and being basted by assorted demons. Actually, in the New England that we were taught in the 17th century that not only this hell was there with all our relatives toasting, but those of the true faith who survived this ordeal and didn't land in hell were on a wonderful sort of promenade deck where they could look down on all this and sing psalms of happy glory while they watched their parents broil. <laughs> Now, we believe this. It's just how stupid we can be. But we believed it in a good faith. We honestly thought this was true. It never occurred to us to wonder in what part of the nature of God hell was located. How a universe composed and created by God, fashioned by the divine will and sustained by the divine wisdom, there's what part of it would be set aside for perdition. We never got around even figuring that out. It came finally to our realization that there was hell. That hell had to be in God. This became less and less attractive as a thought, and we gradually got over it. Now, here in this same picture is the atomic bomb. Is this atomic bomb or perhaps a hundred other things that we will invent in the future, is this great problem that we are presently facing one which actually involves a disillusionment in the nature of God? I don't think that we have any right to assume that such is the case. In the first place, we are dealing only with the most remote extremities of the divine plan. We are dealing only with matter. Actually, atomic fission has occurred by natural causes in space from the beginning. Worlds have exploded and gone to nothing. Universes have come into being. Creatures and creations lived and died. The universal processes go on. I don't think that the atomic bomb represents a universal or divine emergency at all. It represents nothing more or less than a rare example of human stupidity. If this planet and all that it inhabits were to be blown into space, even modern science would be hesitant to suggest that anything had died or that anything had been destroyed. Things had been changed. Change is a mutation everywhere occurring in nature. It is very doubtful if we can assume that the atomic situation is any more um, a danger uh, to the spiritual program of life than the most common accidents and occurrences. It is more spectacular, but probably in no sense essentially different. The atomic bomb cannot touch the great universal pattern, for it is only a fragment, a minute fragment, in one tiny part of that pattern. Now, it is true that all kinds of consequences might come to man. But these consequences relate only to the external physical existence of things. I believe that we will ultimately demonstrate scientifically that we can destroy man's body with a bomb, but that we cannot destroy his soul. That the moment we escape from the peculiar boundary of matter, a boundary which forms walls, houses, doors, and prisons, but does not create any of the lives in these things. 
that this bomb cannot touch any essential value. 